What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Please be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you end up enjoying this video, doing any of those helps the video to do well and the channel to do well, and ensures I can continue making this content daily for many years to come. If you guys have any thoughts about the video, please be sure to share them in the comments below, as I always read all of them, even if I don't always get the chance to respond to them all. Last but not least, if you guys would like to support the channel further than you already do just by watching, liking, subscribing, and all that, please be sure to check out the join button somewhere around the subscribe button. If you click on that, it will let you join the channel membership for as low as $2 a month, and you get special access to emoticons you can use when you comment, and special icons that appear next to your name as well. No content will ever be locked behind the paywall, it's just something extra you can do if you'd like to support the channel further. Without further ado though guys, we'll get right into the stories, and I hope you guys enjoy them. Have a great day. I really love apples. I live really close to a local apple orchard. Every fall, the orchard allows people to pay a fee, come in and pick their own apples. It's pretty fun, and you can get quite a lot for a very cheap price. The biggest problem, though, is that the orchard is so popular that when it first opens to the public in fall, it gets extremely crowded. I hate being around so many people. It really just makes me nervous. However, if you don't get to the orchard early on the first few days of opening, you'll miss out on all the best apples. So, one fall, I thought I had an ingenious, if not completely illegal and unethical idea, as to how I could get the exact apples I wanted. My uncle is one of those anti-government, militia-type guys. He had a pair of night vision goggles. I thought I'd borrow those for a bit, sneak into the orchard, get the apples I want then come back the next day and pay the fee. The orchard wasn't really protected in any serious way. I could get in very easily. I couldn't take a flashlight with me though, because that would certainly give me away. So, hence the goggles. I have to tell you, if you've never used them before, they're pretty damn awesome. It's not really like you see in the movies though. Everything is much sharper and cleaner than you'd see in a film. It's amazing what you can see, and how clearly you can see it. Anyway, I snuck into the orchard with no problem. I had my big bushel basket, and went about picking the apples I wanted. I had been in the orchard for a little over 30 minutes, when I climbed up onto one of the trees to get some apples that hadn't fallen off yet. That's when I heard what sounded like rustling in the leaves covering the ground. Alarmed, I turned around and saw the hugest, scariest looking man I had ever seen in my life. He was really tall and fat, and was carrying a flashlight in one hand, and a knife in the other. I froze in the tree, immediately regretting being the stupid idiot I was for doing this in the first place. I tried to remain still, so the man wouldn't shine the light over me. I had no idea if he worked there, or if maybe he had broken in like me. Either way, while he was walking around with a knife in his hand in pitch black night, I really didn't want to find out. The man came closer and closer, shining the light around. It took every ounce of control I had to keep myself from making noise. This got harder and harder as the man came closer and closer. After a while, he finally made it over to the tree I was in. I had to do everything I could to not shake the tree, because I was definitely shaking myself. I watched as he went over to my basket, looked at it, then swept the area with the light. He stood there for a moment. I swear to God, I thought I was going to pee myself right then and there. It took everything I could manage to keep myself from moving. I kept waiting for the man to shine his light directly up at me. I just knew he would. But after a minute that seemed to last for several hours, he simply kicked my basket over, scattering the apples all over the ground. He began walking off in a different direction, obviously looking for me somewhere else. I didn't know how long I waited there after the man left. I wanted to get down out of the tree right away and get the hell out of that orchard, but I thought that if I did, he would be on his way back and catch me. After a very long period of waiting, I did slowly climb out of the tree, very quietly grab my basket, 
and carefully made my way out of the orchard. As my feet crushed every leaf, I was scared. I jumped thinking the man would come rushing back for me. But I got out of there okay in the end. Now, if that wasn't scary enough, the next day when I went to the orchard prepared to pay my fee, it was closed. The old man who owned the orchard and lived in a farmhouse right on the side of it had been stabbed to death the previous night. It seemed I got my answer as to whether or not the man I'd seen worked there. Obviously, he did not. And yes, lest you think otherwise, I did immediately give a description to the police. As far as I'm aware, though, they never caught the guy. But at least they didn't think it was me that had done it. My scary college experience isn't something that happened to me. It wasn't an experience that happened to anyone I know, but it happened on my college campus while I was going to school there. Like other stories I've told that happened to me, this story is not for any sympathy, so please don't feel sorry for me. I tell it because I love my school, and I think it's important we never forget these things when they happen. It was a very cold day in February. It was on a Thursday, I believe. On Tuesdays and Thursdays during the semester, I only had classes at night, child psychology at 7 p.m., and as I remember, I had a paper due for that class soon. Although I had my own dorm room, I also had a television in that dorm room. I knew that as long as I had the game show network, I was not going to get any of my work done. I grabbed my laptop and went to find a quiet nook in the honors lounge of my dormitory, Mainly, I was working on my citations. I was using the online database of psychology journal articles to work on my paper, so I would look at the article information, switch over to Microsoft Word, type in the information, and then go back. Well, at around 3 p.m., just as I'd finished citing an article, I went to pull up a second article from the database. It was then that a very frightening thing happened. Over the library database page, a red warning notice appeared on the screen. The notice read this, There's been a report of a gunman on campus. Get to a safe area and take precautions until given the all clear. Avoid King's comments in all buildings in that area. Needless to say, I was scared. I unplugged my laptop, ran up the four flights of stairs, and locked myself in my dorm room for what was likely the next half hour. It seemed like an eternity. I kept refreshing the homepage of my school's website, hoping to get some sort of update as to what was going on. It was finally, at some time after 3.30, that the message was updated. The shooter had been killed, but it still instructed everyone to stay in their rooms until further notice. Unfortunately, as the details came in, we learned that a graduate student from another college came to our school, entered a lecture hall, and shot 26 students, killing five of them, before killing himself. I checked my Facebook page that day. There were tons of my friends posting messages to me asking if I was okay. I had to confirm that I'd not been involved with the event whatsoever. We of course held memorials for the students who were involved and made a pledge to never forget what happened on February 14, 2008 at Northern Illinois University. So this story was originally submitted in Japanese by a friend on one of my Japanese horror sites. What follows is my best translation of the story. It's somewhat weird because it happened in an abandoned summer camp in Fukushima, Japan. And what's even weirder is that I didn't know it was abandoned when I initially set out for it. I had been looking for Takaka no Numa Amusement Park, a really famous abandoned park in the area. I had become completely obsessed with it many years ago when I had run across some pictures of it online. I live in Iwaki, which is a coastal town in Fukushima. I had never been to this amusement park before and didn't know anyone else who had been either. Because of this, I didn't really know exactly where it was. There was a bit of an urban legend, you see, that it was impossible to find. If you entered the coordinates on Google Earth, you would not find anything. I've since learned that that's because the park was simply demolished. Well, that information may have helped me those many years ago, but it doesn't really help me too much now that I know it now. 
I would take these excursions out into the hilly area around which the amusement park was said to have stood. It was easy enough to do, as there were no barriers preventing me from going off the street into the hills and searching around. I was exploring, and I got particularly excited when I came across what looked like a bunch of abandoned old cabins. I thought I was on to the first signs of something. I was, however, disappointed when I realized it had nothing to do with the amusement park. It was simply an old abandoned summer camp out in the woods. Well, perhaps it would be exciting to see an abandoned camp as well. This sort of thing is definitely not common in Japan. Despite my initial disappointment, I decided to go and check out this new discovery, and it was pretty interesting. There were a good 15 buildings altogether, so not a particularly large area. There was what looked to be an office, a cafeteria, some cabins, and a few buildings that I couldn't quite discern the nature of. The camp itself must have been very old, too, because the forest had grown over it quite thoroughly. Large trees had grown in the walkways, and bushes and very tall grass covered everything else. It was the sort of scenery you'd expect to see in a very scary movie. I went into one of the cabins, surprised to find that the floor was still fairly sturdy. There were several beds in there, and it smelled musty and moldy. I didn't want to stay inside for too long. Then, though, I saw a bit of movement out of the corner of my eye and stopped in place. There was a very, very skinny old man laying in one of the beds looking directly at me. Oh my god, he was so skinny it looked like he hadn't eaten anything in months. His hair was long and unkept, and his clothing was ratty and full of holes. It consisted of nothing more than a dirty and ripped up pair of slacks and a nasty stained tank top. His eyes were wide open, bulging out of his head, and they looked extremely angry. The man began to make this strange noise, sort of an enraged, gurgling yell. He shot up from the bed, then stood still, screaming at me. It was so weird, it was like he didn't even need to breathe. He didn't come at me at first but began to wildly look around the area. I didn't know what he was doing at first, but I soon figured out he seemed to be looking for a weapon or something. While he was doing so, he kept angrily screaming until he grabbed a large rusty machete and picked it up. I turned tail and ran. I sprinted out of the cabin, out of the camp, and was all the way out before turning back and looking. The man was standing outside, watching me, still screaming and holding that machete. Fortunately, the man was very skinny and weak, and so had no chance of keeping up with me. I kept on running until I was out of the woods, and arrived back at my car. All of this because I was looking for an old abandoned amusement park. I used to babysit for this woman who, honestly, I always felt should have spent more time with her kids rather than hiring a babysitter. She had three children in all, two young boys and one girl, all with her ex-husband. The very fact that she was the one who got custody of them told me that no matter how bad she was, the husband had to be much worse. Just to be clear, by bad, I don't mean she abused her kids in any way because I never noticed any signs of that. She seemed to love them a lot, actually. She was just absent all the time. She would go out partying and drinking and come home all liquored up. Often, she wouldn't even come home at all and would sleep the night somewhere else, I suppose at one of her boyfriend's houses. My friends all wondered why I kept this job, but to me, it was pretty obvious. First, she paid me really well for what I did. Plus, it was already bad enough. The kids didn't have their mother or their father around them. I didn't want to abandon them also. They were really good kids. This story happened on one of the nights when the mom was out partying, and I knew it was going to be an all-nighter. At about 6 p.m., I heard a knock at the door. Going to it, I recognized the man who was there as their father. I'd never met the man myself, but I'd seen several pictures of him so I could be aware if he ever came over. He was not allowed to see the children without some sort of supervision from the courts. The man asked me if he could come in and see his children, which of course I declined. When he asked me where the mother was, I told him that wasn't his business, and I was simply their babysitter. He kept on trying to convince me to let him in, and I kept on declining. 
even tried telling me he must be a better parent than her because at least he was trying to see his children while she was still out partying. I reminded him, though, that wasn't any of my business. Eventually, he gave up and left. I wasn't really too concerned, but I tried to get in touch with their mother anyway, just in case. Not too surprisingly, her cell phone went straight to voicemail, though. I tried not to think about it too much longer, and put it out of my mind for the moment. Normally, I would have put the kids to bed around 8.30 or so, but half an hour before then, a big storm rolled in. The kids were scared of the thunder, so I let them stay up and watch TV with me. The hub was doing a My Little Pony Friendship as Magic marathon, so we watched that together. At about 9 p.m., I saw car lights pull up in the driveway. At first, I assumed it was miraculously the mother getting home earlier. Maybe her date had flaked out on her or something. That theory was immediately dispelled when the window beside the door busted in. The kids screamed and got up and ran to the far end of the room. Looking at the door, I could see a man holding a tire iron, which he must have used to smash the window. The window wasn't big enough for him to get inside, so he reached around and tried to grab the doorknob. I had to decide quickly whether to call the police or to try to keep him from getting inside. Thankfully, the oldest girl was smart enough to run for the phone and dialed the police for me. This meant I had to deal with the outraged father. The man was yelling all sorts of obscenities at me, screaming and calling me slurs, that if I didn't let him see his kids, he was going to gut me in front of them and worse. Of course, anyone with sanity would know that was not a winning argument. Thank God this house had a fireplace, because there I found a poker. I grabbed the poker, ran to the door, and slammed it down on the man's hand. Fortunately for me, it hurt him bad enough to pull his hand out immediately. He began to scream. Unfortunately, the poker was an old piece of crap and broke in half as soon as I hit him. In the storm, there could have been no way he would have seen that, though. While the man was still cursing at me, I heard police sirens begin in between the thunder. He must have heard them, too, because he took off running. He got into his car and left. The cops came to the house and pursued the father. They found his car parked outside of a bar. He went drinking after I fought him off. Needless to say, he was swiftly arrested. The police had a long talk with the mother as well, although I'm not really privy as to what that talk was about. Unfortunately, the family ended up moving, so I was not able to babysit those sweet children again. They gave me big hugs and told me they loved me before they moved, though. That meant the world to me. I did see the mother again, because I had to testify in a hearing. But the father, luckily, that horrid bastard, ended up going to jail for a while. Like everyone else who had just graduated high school and partied throughout their last high school vacation, I was very excited to start my first day of college. I wanted to experience the entire event in sort of a typical, traditional way. It was a two-day drive to get to school, and I thought I would pack up all my belongings in my beater of a car and take the trip to school all alone. You know, enjoy some of the countryside while I was out driving. At the beginning, everything was fine. I started out in the morning and got a lot of driving done while sitting there with the top down in my car, listening to my music. Bad luck soon found its way into my plans, though, about an hour or so before nightfall. Whilst in the middle of driving, out of nowhere, my car just suddenly shut off altogether. The dash lights came on and the steering wheel seized up completely. I was barely able to guide the car off to the side of the road, but fortunately, I did make it. Unfortunately, I was now pretty screwed at this point. I'd been taking winding back roads, not highways, because I wanted to enjoy the countryside. I had driven past quite a lot of farms, but when my car died on me, I was smack dab in the middle of a long stretch of nothing but cornfields. I tried my cell phone, of course, but I was completely unable to get any signal. I didn't have any tools on me either, and I don't think it would have done me much good even if I had. I didn't know the first thing about working on cars. I considered taking a walk trying to get to a farmhouse, but I wasn't really keen on that idea. I didn't like leaving my car alone with all my worldly belongings in it, 
especially as I had already put the top down and I was not going to be able to put it back up. I couldn't even get the car's lights to turn on at this point. My only real option was to sit, wait in the car, and hope I could flag down someone to help me. Needless to say, though, there was very little traffic on this road. With the sun now setting, it seemed like the already scarce amount of cars was about to become even scarcer. It wasn't until well into the night that an old pickup truck came tumbling down the road, with two guys sitting in it. I didn't even have to flag them down. They took notice of me right away and pulled the truck over right in front of my car. The driver got out, but the passenger remained seated. I guess I thought the driver looked pretty creepy. He looked a lot like someone you'd expect to see out in the country in a horror movie. Lots of missing teeth, very dirty clothes. However, I was not about to judge the only person who'd been willing to stop and help me. The man asked me what was wrong, and I told him I really didn't know enough about cars to have any idea what was wrong. I explained to him what had happened, and that I didn't have any tools on me. I told him I was a freshman in college, and really needed to get my car fixed so I could get to school. The man walked over to his pickup truck, and pulled out what looked to be a tire iron. I was confused at first, and called out to him, telling him there was nothing wrong with my tires. I quickly discovered that he did not care. The man swiftly came at me, tire iron raised to strike. I didn't have much time to try and protect myself, and doubted I could have if I wanted to. This guy was a lot bigger than me. I did get my arm up quick enough to make a feeble attempt at catching his arm on the downswing, but it did me very little good. It may have softened the blow, but it was still more than enough of a hit to send me tumbling to the ground and for the entire world to go black. If you've never been knocked out before, I can't really begin to explain to you what it feels like. It's all black, of course, but it's almost like you're aware and unaware of what's going on at the same time. I wasn't sure how long after the hit that I came to, but it was still dark when I opened my eyes. My head was throbbing in a way it never had before or since. I tried to move, only to realize I was now stuck in an enclosed space. It took me a few moments to realize they must have stuck me in the trunk of a car, and if I could fit in the trunk, it meant they had taken my belongings with them. I can't even tell you how long I laid there. I banged on the trunk trying to force it open, but I couldn't. It was the most terrifying time of my life. I had no idea if anyone would stop to try and help me. If I would be stuck there all night or what. I had no idea how serious the blow to my head was either. Whenever I had the strength, I would pound on the trunk in an attempt to get myself out. Finally, after what had to be hours of hell, a local police officer stopped to check out this mysterious car sitting on the side of the road. I heard him outside, so I began banging on the trunk again. I guess the asshole that attacked me had left the keys in the car, so the officer quickly got me out. It was then that I saw they had taken everything of mine. They had cleaned out my trunk and taken everything from the back seat of my car as well, even my clothes. Of course, that was the least of my worries, as the officer had to call an ambulance for me. Fortunately, I was not that seriously injured. I did eventually get to school, but I got there very late. My parents were kind enough to forward me money to buy some new clothes and other things, and I was happy that the experience didn't sour me on school altogether. For future drives, though, I think I'll just take the highway. Back in the day, my parents didn't really have the money to buy me the dress I wanted to wear to homecoming, so I decided to get me a job as a babysitter in order to pay for it myself. It was a bit of a dicey thing to try and do, I suppose. I mean, nowadays, people are understandably cautious about having other people not only in their home, but also watching their children. I actually had to take to showing his parents my report cards and giving them recommendations from my teachers as well. I can understand it, especially after hearing all the horror stories out there, but understanding didn't make it any less frustrating. When I did finally land a job though, the people I found it with were very much the complete opposite of the parents I'd normally get. 
I had brought copies of my cards, all my recommendations, but they seemed genuinely surprised when I offered them up. Even more surprised than I was that they didn't ask for them. They almost seemed like they were trying to cover up for not asking, and feigned interest in seeing them after. I got the job pretty quickly. It was great, too, because it was a standing Friday job and paid extremely well. Because I'd gotten the job so easily, I automatically thought those kids must be real terrors or something. My own parents were fairly strict, but I know a lot of parents don't know how to raise their children right, and they become little terrors. Trust me, I've seen it happen many times. I was pretty nervous on my first night there. I was very pleasantly surprised to find the kids were absolute angels, possibly the most well-behaved kids I'd ever seen in my whole life. I was a bit confused then about why the parents had been like that. I wrote it off as maybe they were just more trusting than most others I'd interviewed with. A few weeks after I'd been initially hired, my friend Jody asked me if I wanted to go to a movie with her on a Friday night. I let her know I wouldn't be able to, because I had that babysitting job. She often babysat too, and asked me lots of questions about what the family was like, how well behaved the kids were, and of course what the job paid. As we were talking, I mentioned the name of the family I was sitting for, and Jody turned white as a sheet. For a girl who spent several nights a week in the tanning booth, this was saying quite a lot. She confirmed the address of the house I was working in, and she shook her head at me telling me I sure was brave. When I asked her to explain what she meant, she told me the house was a bit of a hot potato in the neighborhood. In her own life, she'd seen over six families move in and out of it, and that was only when she was old enough to begin paying attention. She told me the reason why was because there was a family back in the 1960s that had owned the house. Supposedly, they had a 10-year-old girl, but they kept locked up in their shed in the backyard. She didn't go to school, didn't have any friends, they just left her out there in her own filth. She died of malnutrition at the age of 10. Let me be clear, I did not believe her story, and I don't believe it now either. To me, it was just one of those far-fetched urban legends people tell each other. Through the grapevine, they get more and more outrageous over time. Although I didn't believe that particular story, I did become a bit nervous about the house though. I never brought this urban legend up to the parents because I really loved the job and didn't want to lose it by being weird. A couple weeks after Jody told me that story, I was babysitting that Friday night. You know, typical scary story setting, a babysitter on a dark and stormy night. Well, that was what was happening. I had put the kids to bed earlier, and it was about 10pm. The parents were out very late, and I didn't expect them to return home until close to 2 I was in the upstairs den watching The Daily Show when a large boom of thunder shook the house. As expected, soon after the eight-year-old daughter rushed into the den. Aw, honey, are you scared of the thunder? I asked her when she ran up to me. The girl, Ellen, shook her head, though. She said something I couldn't quite understand. When I asked her to repeat herself, I regretted it immediately. No, I'm scared of the girl in the backyard. Of course, I was immediately alarmed. I asked her what she was talking about. She told me to come with her, and she'd show me. I kept hoping to myself that she'd just had a bad dream or something. I was nervous as she led me to her room. She then told me to look out into the backyard. I was scared, of course, but I was the babysitter. This was the very essence of my job, to protect the children. I crept up to the window and peeked out. Of course, there was nothing there. Turning back to Alan, I began to ask her if she was sure she didn't just have a bad dream. Before she could answer, though, I saw something out of the very corner of my eye. My head snapped back to the backyard, and I'll never forget what I saw that night. I saw a girl wearing nothing but a nightgown, crawling across the yard and flopping in the mud. She crawled over to the shed, turned, looked up at the window, nudged the shed door open, went inside, and disappeared. Terrified, I rushed the children into the den and called the police and the parents. They all came out immediately. The police searched the yard and the shed, too. They didn't find the girl. However, they did find mud on the door of the shed and strewn about the floor, as if it had been tracked in recently. So surely someone was in there. 
I didn't believe in ghosts then, and I still don't honestly to this day. I think it must have been a prank set up by my friend Jody, or perhaps a homeless person or something. She denies any involvement, and seemed genuinely terrified when I told her the story. None of the parents nor the police claim to have ever heard the urban legend when I told it to them, so I don't even think that's a real story in the first place. The fact is, I don't know what it was I saw that night. I have no explanation. Even if I did, it was scary as hell when it happened. I lived the summer camp cliché when I was a child. You've probably seen it in movies or on television, perhaps. A kid doesn't want to go to camp and whines and cries until his parents finally send him away. Once the kid gets there, he doesn't really enjoy it at first, but eventually he gets caught up in all the fun, and then summer camp becomes such a part of his life that he doesn't even want to go home when his parents come to get him. Honestly, that's kind of exactly what happened to me. However, when the time came for my parents to grab me, I was all too eager to head home. It's not that I didn't enjoy being at camp either. I absolutely did. We made crafts, went on hikes, and even had an archery tournament. Although, if you've never shot a bow and arrow before, you kind of don't realize how hard it actually is. That didn't matter, though. I was having so much fun that I even enjoyed the food. I think what really got me into enjoying it so much was the cabin I was staying in. There were ten boys in it. We all had two bunks. At night, we would play these little games, mostly truth or dare sorts. You get a bunch of 12 and 13 year old boys in a cabin by themselves, and generally the last thing any of them wants to do is go to sleep. Us boys would of course ask each other naughty questions, to which everyone else would always answer with a bunch of lies. We'd also dare each other to do dumbass things, like crawl across all the tops of the bunks without hitting the floor. One kid was even dared to hump a pillow, and in order to not lose any face, he did just that right in front of everyone. It was a hot night one evening, and we were just playing around like usual. This boy Pete had his turn, and asked me if I wanted a truth question or to take a dare. I chose dare. I wasn't really good at making up lies for those truth questions. His dare was really weird, though. He dared me to switch beds with him, I had a top bunk in the middle of the cabin, and he had the bottom bunk just off to the side. I figured he only dared me because he wanted to sleep on the top. I accepted his dare, and in a way felt a bit relieved he hadn't asked me to do anything more serious. When I took my things and climbed into his bed, I wondered why this kid had given up such a comfortable spot. I mentioned before it was a really hot night. We were in summer camp cabins, so we didn't have AC or fans. The only way we could keep cool was by keeping the windows to the cabin open. The bed he'd traded me for was right next to one of them. It was the ideal spot. I was not sure how much longer we fooled around playing, but eventually we all headed to sleep. I fell asleep as well, even though I can't even remember trying to, and I was dreaming before I knew it. Suddenly though, I felt something grab me in my dream. I recall being very confused at first, it was an uncomfortable enough feeling that it caused me to wake up immediately. My head was hurting, and I quickly realized that someone was grabbing me by the hair and trying to pull me out through the cabin window. I tried to look up to see who this was, but all I could make out was a large shadow of someone pulling my hair extremely hard. I started screaming and woke up the entire cabin. I screamed as loud as I could. This person was really tugging my hair, and my head was already out the window. He was trying to pull me out with him. The other kids in the cabin were wide awake now, and when they realized what was happening, they ran out to grab some of the counselors. The counselors didn't get there fast enough for me. The man managed to get me halfway out of the window as I continued to scream. Then I caught sight of his face. He was nasty looking, covered in boils and dirt, no teeth at all. He was scowling at me, with his mouth clenched like he was extremely angry. It made no sense as to why he'd be attacking me. Just before he got me all the way out the window, two of the counselors arrived and tackled the man like high school football players. I got free of his grip. 
They then proceeded to beat the ever-loving shit out of the guy as I climbed back in through the window. The counselors really went to town on that man. The police were called, and they eventually took the extremely roughed-up man away. When the counselors and the police were talking to us about what happened, one of the counselors asked why I wasn't in my assigned bed. I explained to him the truth or dare game and told him that Pete had asked me to switch beds that night. Pete, when asked why he did this, simply told the other counselors, Well, I saw a scary man hiding in the trees. He was watching the cabin and I didn't want to be in my bed right next to the window, so I traded beds with someone else. Pete, you're a dickhead. When I was 19 years old, I got into a bit of a fight with my stepfather. It was a long time ago, but even now, I still think I was more right than he was. He was a bit of an asshole, and ever since he moved in, he always tried his best to get me and my brother out of the house. He always, however, bent backwards to make sure that my sister could stay as long as she wanted, but I digress. As a result of this huge fight, I had to find myself a roommate pretty quickly. There was no way I could afford to get a place all by myself. After a few weeks of looking, I found a roommate in Chicago, renting a room I knew I could afford. I was lucky to also find someone I thought I would get along with just fine. This guy, named TJ, seemed to like me, and he was an actor as well. We liked the same types of movies, had the same hobbies. We had a lot of things in common, honestly. When I moved in, though, it didn't take me very long to realize I had completely misjudged TJ. Even though I was paying as much as he was in rent, he constantly lorded it over me that since I was not on the lease, it was his apartment, not mine, and he could do whatever he wanted. When I had first moved in, we had agreed upon a set of rules which I thought were pretty fair, but I hadn't been there for more than a week when he began to amend the rules to be much more in his favor than mine. He also became very sullen, and although I kept to myself mostly, he would always groan whenever I got home from work and complain. It was as if he thought me being there at all was an inconvenience. It sure wasn't an inconvenience whenever I gave him the rent check, though. I had been talking to a friend of mine named John, who insisted I should just move out. I was completely unhappy there, and he wanted me to just leave. I told him, though, that I was way too nervous about approaching TJ about wanting to leave, when I was only a single month into living there. John told me that I shouldn't even tell him I was leaving. I should just grab my things and leave overnight, or perhaps when he was at school. I really couldn't see myself doing that, though. The straw that finally broke the camel's back was one night, when TJ tried to get me involved in a threesome with some random person he invited over. I was disgusted at the idea, and told him I wasn't interested. He began to treat me as if I was a bad person at that point, and he completely held it against me from then on. I should have taken John's advice and moved out when he was at school, but for some reason, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I really didn't want to have to face him either, though, so instead, like an idiot, I wrote a note. I put the note on TJ's bed, telling him I was giving him 30 days and then I was promptly moving out. Then, I went to bed. In the middle of the night, I was suddenly woken up by TJ slamming on my bedroom door. I had the door locked, and he was demanding I let him in. I refused, since it was obvious he was quite angry. He was pounding and screaming. I went to pick up the phone because I thought I should call the police. However, before I even had the chance to, he actually broke down the door. I was so surprised I dropped my phone. TJ ran over and grabbed my shirt. He then began to scream in my face. He was telling me that I would have to keep paying half the rent for as long as he wanted me to, and all sorts of other obscene things. He then slammed me against the wall and hit my head against it. My senses went all fuzzy for a moment. Before I even knew what was going on, he grabbed a glass of water off my nightstand and smacked me on the forehead with it, shattering the glass. Both myself and the bed were now completely covered in shattered glass. I was too woozy to even react. TJ's rage just pushed him on. While I was trying to recover from his initial hit, he grabbed me again and began to strangle me. 
I knew I had to do something, or this psychopath was going to kill me. I reached up and slammed him in the nose. I had no leverage, of course, but I think he was so shocked I'd punched him at all that he let me go. I got up and the glass fell off of me. I decided the best thing was to try and get out of the house as soon as possible. I sprinted out into the hallway before he grabbed me from behind. My fight or flight reversed its direction. I turned around and punched him three times right in the center of his nose. He fell back onto his ass and I ran outside the apartment. I had to call the police to escort me in to move my things out afterward. Since there were no witnesses to the event, the police said it was just TJ's word against mine. It really irritated me. That jerk should have gone to jail for what he did. Hell, when I told the police officers about the glass, he had the audacity to say I'd thrown it. Then why was my bed now covered in glass? I don't know. Well, afterwards, I was able to find an efficient apartment for a cheap price that I could move into alone and soon. I guess I really should have just taken my friend John's advice and left while he wasn't home. When I was 10, my parents and I lived across the street from my grandmother. It was around 8.30 or 9 p.m. It had been dark for about 15 to 20 minutes. I told my mom I was going to quickly run across the street to my grandmother's house. Instead of going across the street, though, I walked over to a convenience store about six blocks away. On my way back, while devouring my Three Musketeers bar I'd acquired at the store, I came upon an intersection. A car about a block away was going through the intersection as well. Out of nowhere, this person slammed on their brakes, squealed in reverse and whipped their car around, and then started gunning it right at me. At this point, it was pitch black. No one was out, so I took off running for my life. I cut between a house and hopped a fence and started down a random alley. I could see his bright headlights behind me. They seemingly slowed down as he tried to turn into this tight space. I dived down and hid behind two trash cans while this fucker creeped by at two miles an hour, obviously searching for me. He passed through and pulled out of the alley. I could hear his tires squealing. I was shaking and paralyzed with fear. I waited for 20 or 30 seconds to get my shit together. I stood up and made it less than 20 feet. When I saw his headlights returning to the alley once again, this time I was behind someone's detached garage. Looking around the corner of the garage, I could see the man had now emerged from his vehicle. I couldn't make out his face at all as it was covered. I could see his head was on a swivel, practically breaking his neck searching for me. He pulled back out of the alley after getting back into his car, and I hopped through every person's backyard for three blocks until I made it home. The part that sucks as an adult is knowing how dangerous that situation is. I didn't tell my parents because I didn't want to get busted for lying. I feel really bad now though. Someone should have been notified. The authorities definitely should have been looking for this guy. Right on the outside of town, there's an old railroad track. At this time, I had lived in this town for about 10 years. I could count on my hands how many times I'd actually seen a train moving on it. However, right after a bridge, there was another off track. I'm not really sure what you'd call it. There were often train cars parked there for a really long period of time. The area around there was very heavily wooded. There was a road that went through it and up a hill as well. There were a few houses up there, but very spread apart. I would often take that road because it was a shortcut to get back home, and it led to a field as well. That's how I knew about the train cars that were often parked there. I was walking with a friend one day when he decided he wanted to take some pictures of those train cars. He was designing some sort of game, I believe, and felt he needed pictures to model off of. After taking pictures of some of the back cars, he wanted to walk to the ones in front as well. We had been snapping photos for a good 15 minutes at that point. As we started walking forward, though, we noticed something. Someone snuck out from between two of the cars and then started to walk in our direction. I can't explain why, 
but seeing this guy made us both feel very uncomfortable right away. There were rarely any people back in that area. I asked my friend if maybe we should just go now. For some reason, the appearance of the guy who was a bit far from us was making him feel uneasy too. We decided to just leave and come back at a later time. About a week later, he and I went on another walk. We decided to take that back road again. He needed to take some more pictures. Same train was there, but that's not a big surprise. It would sit there for months at a time. We were going to try to go to the front of the train again and take those pictures of the front cars we didn't get last time. As we began walking in that direction though, it happened again. A guy just came out of nowhere from between two of the cars. It could have been the exact same one from the first time. Once again, there was something very creepy feeling about the whole thing. My friend and I decided to just leave again. We talked about it for a while and came to a simple conclusion. There must have been some homeless people sleeping in those cars or something. We figured for that reason, he must have been living in between them maybe. Perhaps he just didn't want anyone snooping around his living area. We decided that maybe we'd just stop bothering him and stop trying to get those pictures. We kept away from that train area for quite a while. My friend was really stubborn though and really wanted those pictures of that train. After a period of time, we decided it had probably been long enough and we wanted to go back. My friend was taking pictures going further down the track than we had before. Since the man hadn't come out yet, we figured he'd moved on since then. My friend started going between the cars to get pictures that he needed. This happened so quick that it took me by complete surprise. The man just suddenly pounced out from behind one of the cars, screaming all sorts of gibberish. He was holding what looked like a knife in his hand, and he began to sprint towards my buddy. My friend was closer to the man than I was. He fell over in surprise. The crazy man easily jumped on him and held him down. My friend was struggling to get up. I hate to admit, but I almost ran away in fear. I knew I had to help my friend somehow though. I ran over there and tried my best to pull this guy off of him. The man was a lot stronger than I'd thought though. With the combined strength of me and my buddy, we were just barely able to push him off. The guy stumbled backwards and fell down. I tried my best to heave my friend to his feet. By the time he was up, the crazy man was up too. This was the first time I got a look at him. His eyes were chilling to me. They made Norman Bates look normal. His face was covered in blood. It was only then that I realized he'd actually bitten my friend. It was too much. The two of us took off running. The man chased after us with his knife, but fortunately only as far as the end of the train. We were able to get out of there safely from that point on. My friend had been bitten so bad he had to go to the hospital. The police went and arrested the man who attacked us. They found tons of dead animals in the area where he'd been hiding. It looked like he'd been eating some of them. He went to jail for the attack. Three years for aggravated assault. The two of us, though, were stuck with the memory. This is a story that happened when I was in the hospital about 15 years ago. Well, I wasn't in the hospital myself. I was at the hospital a lot, though, visiting my boyfriend. Yes, I am gay, and this is very important to the story. I'm sure it had a lot to do with what happened. My boyfriend at the time had been in a head-on collision. I'll never forget when I heard about it. My body went numb, and I even blacked out for a moment. Seeing him in the ICU in a coma was just so bizarre. It was almost like he wasn't even my boyfriend. Like whatever made him Jamie was just gone. I'm not even sure if I'm explaining it correctly. It was just so odd to see him like this. I was allowed to spend time with him in the ICU because I was his medical proxy. His family was severely homophobic and we worried that something like this might happen. He knew his family would never let me in to see him so he'd filled out the paperwork and our attorney filed it. It was established that I had full control over the situation. I, in fact, could even keep his family from seeing him if I wanted to. I'm not that kind of person, though, so his family was free to visit as often as they wanted, as long as I was made aware of the situation. My control over the matter did not sit well with his mom, of course. Jamie and his mom had never gotten along anyway. She would raise hell with the doctors about how Jamie was her son, 
and I was just the slur boyfriend. Yes, she used the term. I was not a true member of the family. They had better get her consent, not mine. Update her first on everything. At first, this was barely an inconvenience. I was willing to put up with it. I thought Jamie would have liked his mom to be there. Eventually, though, the doctors told me that her fighting with them so much, in front of Jamie no less, was a huge distraction to them, and the stress was affecting Jamie negatively. I tried to talk to her, but there's no talking to that woman. I tried to be nice and let her know I wanted her to be able to see her son. He had signed me in as his medical proxy. I was legally in control of the situation, and that was not going to change no matter how much she complained. She needed to quit arguing with the doctors and let them do their job. Oh yeah? Well why don't you just get AIDS and die, you stupid... Jamie's mom sneered at me and called me a slur. That was it. I had been patient. I had been nice way beyond the expectations of anyone who would have been in my situation. I had her removed immediately. It was terrible. She yelled and screamed and called me and the doctors all sorts of slurs. Carried on about how I was going to hell, converting her son and making him into a... She was removed by security. Actually, the police. Two nights later, I was leaving the hospital, heading for the hotel I was staying at. All of a sudden, I noticed some guy who had been sitting on the couch in the waiting area almost all day get up to follow me. He was big and dressed all in camouflage. He walked out behind me and into the parking garage. I was worried it might be a friend of Jamie's mom. I was confident, though, he would at least not try to do anything to me in the hospital. There were cameras and police officers all around, after all. I made it to my car and got in. Didn't take long at all before a pickup truck pulled up behind me as I was leaving the garage. Not only was it sitting awfully high, but the truck had its high beams on, too. Annoying as hell. I left the parking garage and turned left. The truck followed me. At first, I thought it was nothing to worry about. He had to turn left or right anyway so it was a 50-50 chance. When I made it to a red light, I flipped on my turn signal. Immediately, the truck turned on the same signal. I tried to put it out of my head, until the exact same thing happened the next light. And again, and again, I debated back and forth in my head whether this was just being made up, or if this guy was really following me. I turned on my right signal when I was supposed to make a left turn. The truck turned on their signal as well. I turned left instead, though. The truck switched their signals and followed me. No doubt they were tailing me. I made a turn I didn't have to make, and they still turned with me. In fact, I went in a complete circle and they followed me the whole way. I was terrified. I didn't even live in this city. Jamie had been airlifted there, and that's why I was staying in a hotel. I didn't know anyone other than the people in the hospital. I also didn't know where the police station was. I had no idea what to do but to keep driving. It was very late, past midnight so there were not a lot of places or parking lots I could pull into where I could get help. I mean, there were lots, but they were all empty. None of that mattered, though. When I was feeling most frantic, I came to another red light and stopped. The truck, instead of stopping, ran right into me. My car died immediately. I was startled and scared out of my mind. I'd been wearing my seatbelt, thankfully, and hadn't been injured. The pickup wasn't hurt as badly as my now stalled car. Thankfully for me, the fucker just drove off, though. I figure what happened is Jamie's mom must have had this guy ram into me in the hopes I would be hospitalized or something. Then she could control her son's medical situation. Maybe that's why the guy waited for me and followed me for so long, getting up the nerve to actually do it. Maybe he was going to attack me, but decided I wasn't going to get out of the car and figured ramming me was a good idea. Well, it wasn't for him. The man was caught. It was Jamie's mom's cousin, of course. He went to jail for a hit and run, as I couldn't prove it was premeditated. Yes, he had been following me, but I had no evidence. His mother swore up and down that she had nothing to do with it, but nobody believed her. Jamie cut her out of his life completely when he recovered. It's been 15 years and we haven't heard from her at all. It was Jamie's decision, not mine, and we're still happily together today. This story is not safe for work. This happened around the early 70s or so, very early. My family, including my uncle by marriage, were all born and raised in the same tiny area in the deep south. 
This story is still told at family reunions and similar occasions, and I have full permission to share this as well. My uncle went away, fought in Vietnam, returned home, and he and my aunt, who was my dad's older sister, were married. While my uncle was in Vietnam, he said when something bad was going to happen, like something awful to one of his friends over there, or when there was a bad battle with his company, he would always feel it beforehand. There would just be a terrible sense of dread. Sometimes he would have that dread for a week or so before anything happened. Sometimes it would appear an hour before, or anywhere in between. It was January or February sometime, and the weather had been unseasonably warm that year. My aunt and uncle had only been married a few months, and he was going to go out of town the following day after this incident happened, for something job-related. That meant he would have been gone for two weeks. He and my aunt were not looking forward to being apart. So, it's a Sunday, and they decided to make that day very special. He went to church with her, which was something he rarely did. And they decided to splurge and eat at one of our great seafood restaurants. Afterward, they were going to take a romantic walk on the beach. My aunt said they were having such a great time, seeing old friends at church, going to that good restaurant. It was one of those days where everything seemed to be going absolutely perfectly. On the way to the beach they were headed to, though, my uncle began to have that same sense of dread, just the same as he'd had when he was in Vietnam. He didn't want to spoil my aunt's fun. He was beginning to suspect it might be something like what they call now PTSD. Back then, it was called flashbacks. He was trying not to let it bother him because of this, but the sense of foreboding was getting so bad. They arrived to the beach. To explain something about this particular beach, he had to park beside the road and walk across a wide expanse of sand to get to the water. This beach was also very secluded, especially in winter. My aunt was walking, collecting shells and having a great time. They saw another young couple walking also. My aunt and uncle didn't know them. They seemed to be late teens in age. All of a sudden, my uncle couldn't fight that bad feeling any longer. He grabbed my aunt by the arm and said, Let's get out of here. She got mad, of course, saying she wasn't ready to go yet, but he started to drag her across the sand towards their car, arguing the whole way. He didn't tell her what was wrong. I guess even he felt he was probably just having a flashback, but he said he felt 100% better once they were back in the car and headed home. My aunt very quickly got over being mad as well. As they were driving, a large car with four guys in it passed them on the road, heading down towards that beach. Anyway, in the story in the newspapers the following day, my uncle realized why he'd had such a bad feeling. Those four guys kidnapped the guy and his girlfriend. They were on some sort of drugs. They put the guy in the trunk and took his woman out and assaulted her for hours. They had a gun and kidnapped them from the beach at gunpoint. This shocked the whole area because it had always been very low crime. If my aunt and uncle would have stayed on that beach, there's no telling what would have happened to her, and they probably would have shot him. He would have fought to try and give her a chance to get away. The law had been looking for these four guys all day, because the guys had also gotten into some other mischief the day before. They had a description of them and their vehicle, and they were caught very swiftly after. I'm definitely a workaholic. I'm one of those sorts of guys who very often stays at the office hours past when I'm scheduled. When I'm on the way home, it's usually very dark outside because of this, and there's little to no traffic as well. I tend to arrive home, eat something really quickly, and slip right into bed. Then the next morning, I start the pattern all over again. I live alone, so it really isn't a problem though. I don't have a wife or a girlfriend or even a dog waiting for me at home, so it's not like there's anyone to complain. I do have my own house, though. It's a beautiful townhouse in a really upscale neighborhood in the city. Anyway, the night this story happened, I was working really, really late at night. I'd gotten myself particularly invested in this project and was completely losing track of time. I was hit with a sudden sleepiness and emitted a long yawn. When I looked up at the clock, 
I noticed it was now past midnight. I was mildly shocked, because although I did often stay really late at work, this was nearly seven hours after quitting time. I decided to put my work away and get my ass home. Driving home was rather dangerous, actually. I'd worked so hard that I was completely exhausted, and it was difficult to even keep my eyes open. It was really cold outside as well. I went ahead and rolled my window down, in the hopes that the cold wind would help me stay awake. When I got to my house, I rushed in all tuckered out. Normally, I would take a shower before bed and get into my pajamas, but I didn't even have that in me. I kicked my clothes off and threw them on the couch. Didn't even turn on any of the lights in the house. My eyes were so heavy, I figured it would just hurt my eyes to do so. I trudged through, up the stairs, and made it to my bedroom. I swear at this point my eyes were just completely closed. I couldn't even open them a little bit. I flopped down on my queen-size bed and didn't even bother covering myself up. I began to doze off quickly, but something strange happened. Out of nowhere, my bed shook a bit. At first, my mind dismissed it as some sort of sleep consciousness thing, but then I felt my bed shake again and I began to hear a shuffling noise as well. Although I had been struggling to stay awake for a while, I snapped awake at this point. Looking towards the other side of my bed, I could see a dark figure standing between my bed and the far wall. At that point, I was completely awake. I screamed a bit and jumped up, sort of like when you see a scary bug or a snake and you have to jump away. I bumped into my nightstand. I reached out and grabbed my lamp. It was one of those touch lamps. When the light came on, I saw who had been in my bed. An old, dirty-looking man was standing in my room. He had stripped himself down to his filthy underwear and must have been sleeping right next to me. I was simultaneously disgusted and scared at the same time. I wasn't sure what to do. I grabbed my lamp and turned it off. The man tried running around the bed to get out of the room, I guess. I should have let him go, probably, but I just couldn't do so. I threw the damn lamp at him hitting him and knocking him over. I then ran out of my room, down the stairs, grabbed my phone, and called 911. The police came and grabbed the man. He had broken into my house through the back door, it seemed. It was so cold out that night, he just couldn't take it outside. He'd broken in just a couple of hours before I came home. I guess he figured that since it was so late at night, and nobody was there, he wouldn't be expecting anyone to come home that night. He broke my back door open, ate my food, stripped down, and went to sleep in my bed. I would have noticed this earlier had I not been so sleepy from working that night. My best friend growing up was a guy named Joey. We were friends for as long as I could remember. Starting back when we were around 8 years old, we started the age-old ritual of having sleepovers. We'd have one at least once a month. Strange thing was, though, all the sleepovers were always at my house. I never really thought about it much until I was around 11 years old. We were talking about having a sleepover on Halloween, which was only a few weeks away. Joey began asking me what my mom would be making for our Halloween dinner. It was then that I finally brought it up to Joey. I asked him why we never had sleepovers at his place instead. Right away, he seemed like he didn't really want to talk about sleepovers anymore. He just changed the subject. I didn't want to press it at the time, so I just let it go. A couple of days later after school, Joey and I were walking home together. I remember this very vividly because it was one of those days when the leaves were constantly falling from the trees almost like it was raining down. Joey told me he was sorry he hadn't answered my question the other day. He said he never wanted anyone to come over to his house overnight because he believed that his shed was haunted. I was a bit confused. I had heard stories of houses being haunted. I had heard of schools and theaters being haunted, but I'd never heard of anyone saying a haunted shed existed. I wondered, even if this shed was haunted, why would that keep him from wanting to have a sleepover at his place? He told me that the only time he had seen the ghost was when his older brother had sleepovers, so he thought it would happen too if he had anyone over as well. Still, he told me he wanted to stay at my place, and if I ever wanted to stay over during the weekend, 
he would be fine with trying it out at least once. So, that Friday night, instead of going home, I walked with Joey over to his house. Although I hadn't ever slept there, I had hung out with him several times. We had a good and pretty fun evening. I didn't want to piss him off, but I was really super curious about the ghosts. After we were alone and watching some movies, I asked Joey to tell me a bit more about what was going on. Immediately, he didn't seem like he was having such a good time anymore. It's in the shed, Joey said. If you want to watch the shed from my bedroom window, I guess you can. I sort of did want to, but I also sort of didn't. I could tell, though, that talking about it was really upsetting my best friend. So, we just went back to enjoying ourselves. When we went to sleep in Joey's room, he fell asleep pretty quickly. I was hanging out in my sleeping bag, and I just couldn't get the idea of that ghost out of my head. Now, I didn't necessarily believe in ghosts myself. I thought that whatever Joey had seen, there must be another explanation for it. Anyway, as soon as I was sure he was asleep, I went and peeked out that window. There was a light from the back of the house that shone on the backyard, right towards that shed. I sat there for about 10 minutes, wondering what it was my friend had seen. If this ghost only appeared on sleepover nights, it made sense to me that it was probably just Joey's brother trying to scare him. I sat there for another 10 minutes before I decided to give up and go back to bed. Immediately as soon as I started to turn around though, I saw something in the backyard. I could tell it was a humanoid figure, wearing nothing but a pair of shorts, crawling from the backyard on their hands and knees. They moved very slowly, deliberately, with these weird jerky movements. They made their way over to the shed, pried the doors open, and slipped silently inside. Needless to say, I was now absolutely freaked out. I quickly went over to my sleeping bag, crawled in, and pulled it over my head. It took me forever to fall asleep, and when I did, it was not a restful one either. The next morning, I told Joey about what I'd seen. He confirmed that this is what he'd seen the previous times as well. Now, an 11-year-old is probably a lot more likely than an adult to believe they actually saw a ghost. I was freaked out. As mentioned before, this only seemed to happen on sleepover nights. Joey had an older brother, and looking back, I wouldn't be surprised if it was some sort of prank of his. But when we went to check the next day, we couldn't find any signs of someone being there. It was so strange. Maybe it really was a ghost. This all started about a month ago, when a man started banging on my door at 6 o'clock at night, yelling for a mic to come out and see him, that he needed to get his cigarettes from the man. I told him he had the wrong house and to leave. There had never been a mic that lived in this house. The man got even more aggressive, calling me a liar and how he was going to come in and beat that skinny bitch I lived with. I tried to call the non-emergency police line because I'd never called 911 before. They didn't even pick up. Looking back, it seems kind of stupid, but it was instinct. After some more shouting, he eventually left. I called my father, who was across town, to come home and told him what was going on. He showed up soon after. He called 911 to file a report. The man came back, though, and started screaming at my father as well. The cops were called again and showed up an hour after the call. They couldn't find the man and told me to simply defend myself if it came to it. After that, I ended up staying with a friend for the night because I didn't feel safe at home. I can be a strong person, but I don't think I can do much against a drugged out monster. What made the situation even scarier to me is that while I was going through my driveway camera photos to check after, it showed him walking up to my house hours before and circling around it, and I had no clue. I had really bad anxiety, so the next few days were filled with paranoia and stress. Finally, I managed to calm down somewhat and convince myself that would simply be the end of it. Come that weekend, my father went on a trip with his girlfriend, so I was left alone for a couple of days. I had just put on a scary movie when I heard screaming again and a loud bang. I pulled up my camera to see the man was pacing back and forth on the sidewalk 
and had thrown over our trash can, again screaming for this mic. I called 911. They showed up within minutes this time and were able to stop him down the street. They told me there was nothing they could do though since he hadn't committed a crime yet. If he came back to call again, and then they'll have more reason to hold him. Things were quiet for a few weeks after, and again, I believe that would be the end of it. That was until today. This morning, my father and I got into an argument, so I wanted to take a walk to clear my mind. I went across the street to a park and sat by a tree watching cars pass by every now and then. A beautiful morning with beautiful weather. All of a sudden, though, I noticed a truck slowly drive down the left side of the park and turn to the street my back was facing. The man inside waved as he passed by, so I did too, thinking it must be a man going to work or something. He pulled off onto the right side of the park, stopped, and made a U-turn to come back. Red flags instantly went off in my head, so I got up to start leaving. I looked back only to see the person had turned off their headlights and was now trailing me. I got to the front of my house and he slowed down. I got a better look at his face this time, and it looked just like the man who had been harassing me. From the physical characteristics to his signature baseball cap, he glared at me like I'd taken everything in his life away from him. I got to the door and tried to barge in. My father put the chain on in anger of me walking out, but I had to scream at him that I was being followed in to open the door. He opened it quickly, but by then the truck had shot down the street. I'm terrified to leave my own home. I don't have a car to get anywhere quickly. I have to bike everywhere. Even now, though, I'm scared to do that. I don't know who this man is or what his intentions are. My parents sent me to summer camp every summer. I liked it well enough, but I assumed they sent me there to make their lives easier. They probably saw it as a summer babysitting job, but a parent should always make sure their babysitters are capable of fully protecting their children before sending them away. I began going to camp as soon as I was old enough to do so. I got really used to spending a large portion of my summer sleeping in a cabin with no air conditioning no television, and nine other boys who were roughly my age. I was always able to fall asleep pretty easily in the muggy and often noisy cabin. During a particular summer when I was 13 years old, though, I had a pretty awful experience. There were five bunk beds in the cabin, each set along the walls. There were two on the back wall and one on each of the other walls. This summer, I was sleeping in the bottom bunk on the side wall. Though I had fallen asleep rather quickly, I was woken up suddenly in the middle of the night and saw something I couldn't quite make out at first. Keep in mind, I was very groggy, and the unbelievably humid air in the cabin didn't help me wake up any faster. We did have some fans set in there, but they didn't really do a whole lot to help. It was very dark, but I could see what looked like the shadow of an adult figure standing across the room. It was at the bed just parallel to my own. I couldn't make out who this was, but they were fairly tall. They could easily see up to the top bunk without any real effort. He was also doing something with his hand. I assumed he was nudging the person in the bed to check and see if he was awake. I thought it must have been one of the counselors and didn't think too much more about it. I turned around and adjusted the sheets off my feet and pretty quickly fell back asleep. The next day, I was assigned to do some activities with the kid who had been sleeping in that bunk. His name was Alan. In the light of the day, my mind was much clearer, and I was having a lot of weird feelings about what I'd seen the night before. My first thought was that one of the camp counselors must have been molesting Alan. His presence in the cabin and the movements by the bed made it seem possible. But if that were the case, Alan didn't seem to be acting like anything bad had happened. In fact, he was in an excellent mood, and we had a lot of fun together that day. The following night, though, I made the same observation again. I once again woke up in the middle of the night and saw that same tall, dark figure standing next to Alan's bunk. He looked again like he was trying to nudge Alan to see if he was awake. This time, I was a bit put off by what I was seeing. I was in fact worried that whatever the guy was doing to Alan... He might do it to everyone else too, and maybe even hurt Alan. 
I made it a point that I was going to ask Alan the following day about what this guy's deal was and maybe see if we needed to talk to another counselor together. When morning came, I was the first one to get up. I immediately remembered seeing what was happening the previous night and ran to Alan's bed to wake him up and talk about it. When I got up though, I looked over at Alan's bunk and saw it was now empty. I was immediately alarmed because his bed was not made either. We were required to make our beds before leaving the cabin in the morning, and Alan was always a stickler for the rules. I ran immediately to talk to my counselor. I was worried whoever had been in the cabin that night must have taken Alan. The counselor hadn't seen him and contacted camp security, but Alan was nowhere to be found. He didn't show up at any of the events that day. He was simply gone. The surrounding forest was searched, and Casey'd simply wandered out and gotten lost. Or, in the worst case, if something else had happened. But no one ever found him. Even now, many years later, I have no idea what happened to Alan. I've dealt with immeasurable amounts of guilt for not getting up that night to confront the man and see what was really happening. Obviously, whoever that guy was, he took Alan away. Maybe I would have been able to stop it if I'd gotten up and said something to the man. I'm sorry, Alan. The scariest thing that ever happened to me happened while I was at summer camp. I used to go there every summer. I'm a boy and I really enjoyed it. I looked forward to it as well and when my parents dropped me off, I was so excited I barely even said goodbye to them. I ran off immediately to try and get myself involved in the various activities. When I was 15 years old, I even got the opportunity to be a counselor myself. It was great actually. I had been going there yearly and knew the place inside and out. I was generally seen as pretty responsible. Being a counselor meant I was allowed to take out canoes whenever I wanted to. I especially loved canoeing, so this was a really big plus for me. Being a counselor, though, was much harder work than I'd initially thought it would be. A lot of the younger boys were brats, of course, and it was difficult trying to control so many kids at once. I had to break up several fights and make sure kids were going to bed when they were supposed to and help care for them when they got hurt. I also had to make all their schedules as well. It was real tough work. I guess I never realized that I was just like them when I was their age. I finally got a break one day when I asked to be let off the nature hike roster. I had been working so hard that the supervisors decided I needed some rest. I decided I was going to spend the day doing the only thing I could do that would get me completely away from any kids. I decided to go out on the canoe. The camp that I worked in was by this nice, beautiful, long river. No sooner had I set out, making sure I was going the opposite way of the nature hikes, than I felt a supreme sense of relief. The trees were so beautiful on each side of the river and I got such a good view of the many hills around the camp. The water was calm and still that day too, so it was a very easy-going experience. I was now alone in this empty area. It was pretty quiet for the most part, other than the frequent buzzing of what I assume were cicadas or the occasional cry of a loon. Loon cries can be a bit unnerving if you've never heard one, but at least I could figure out what they were. With the echoing sound of the river valley though, it made their cries seem so much more eerie. When I had been rowing for a long time, I began to hear a different noise. It sounded as if someone were possibly chopping a tree or something. I was surprised when I heard this, but I wasn't really worried. If I had accidentally wandered onto anyone's property, I would just explain myself and leave right away. My canoe began getting closer and closer to the noise as I kept on rowing. Eventually, I was able to hear the original sound. There was definitely someone chopping something. I became intrigued. Maybe someone was building something out here. It wasn't too long before I eventually was able to make out some movement up ahead of me. There was someone in the woods on the left side of the forest, but I couldn't quite tell what they were doing. At first, I tried to make it out by just squinting, but then I recalled that I'd brought some binoculars with me. I took them out. This was a bit of a pain. Obviously, it's difficult to look through a pair of binoculars while also trying to control a canoe. 
In fact, it gave me a bit of motion sickness. Eventually, though, I did get a view of the man who was up on the hill. He appeared to be chopping a log on the ground. I realized it was nothing too important, but figured the man probably owned the area and decided to go ahead and turn back around. However, just before I had decided to put my binoculars down, I saw him swing the axe into this log. Then he moved away. I had to do a double take to make sure I was seeing what I thought I was seeing. There was a man lying on the log, with the axe firmly embedded in his chest. I dropped the binoculars into the canoe, afraid for my own safety. The man was pretty far away, but if I could see him through the trees with my binoculars, it was possible he could see me way out in the open on the river. I was thankful the river was calm at least, as I frantically paddled my way back towards the camp. The return trip was a nightmare. The peaceful sounds I'd heard on my way down the river no longer seemed so peaceful. Every loon cry made my heart jump. Every sound of an animal moving through the trees made my heart race. I kept on thinking it could be that man, that he knew I'd seen what he was doing. If he was willing to do that to whoever that person was, what was he willing to do to me? It took me a few hours to get back, but boy was I so relieved when I did. I told my supervisors what I'd seen, but they immediately dismissed me. They told me I'd probably misconstrued what was going on. I was looking through binoculars on a canoe through trees, to be fair. Besides, it would be nearly impossible to find someone in those hills if something really had happened. A bit cavalier, if you ask me, but I really had no choice but to accept what they told me. I did continue going back to summer camp until I went off to college, but I never again went off on my own for any reason. There are always some things that everyone associates with the different seasons. You have snow in winter, everything comes back to life in the spring, you see baseball in the summer, and most people associate cool air and leaves turning brown and falling from the trees with autumn. Not me, though. I always knew fall as the time when the walker came back. The walker was a nickname that we gave to this guy who, you guessed it, we would always see going for a walk every evening during the fall. He seemed to be an older man, but not like a senior or anything, maybe in his late 40s or so. Starting on the autumnal equinox, he would begin taking a walk around the neighborhood. Every time, about an hour before sunset, he would keep this up all the way into the winter solstice. No kidding, right? Then he would suddenly stop. I remember him from when I was about five years old and it never failed. He would do this in the same way at the same time every single year. We never even got to talk to the man, and I never saw anyone approach him at all. He never even looked at us when he was out for his walk. Of course, when you have someone like that in your neighborhood, both adults and children begin telling stories about them. You know, people like to spread nonsense about those antisocial types. The rumors about this guy range from being a simple man whose wife died in the fall to him being a psychotic war veteran out on the prowl. Among us children, however, the stories were a bit more severe. Some people claimed he was a child molester or even a child murderer out searching for more victims. Some of the more imaginative kids thought he might be some sort of monster in disguise. There was a very popular story amongst my friends that the man was a werewolf who was depressed because he'd killed his wife and as a result spent the fall days walking around the block mourning her. Well, I only gave the stories about as much validity as any kid might have, or any rational kid at least. That is to say, I didn't believe them, of course. To me, I always just thought he was a guy who probably liked the fall and went for a walk after he got off work. He probably didn't like it when it was hot or really cold weather, so he didn't go during the winter or summer seemed perfectly reasonable to me. Everything everyone else said about him was just them making up stories about someone they didn't know to excite themselves. When I was 13, my friends and I were playing at the park. It was in the fall and the leaves had already been falling for weeks. We were playing some no-rules football. Off in the distance, one of my friends noticed that the walker was coming in our direction. My friends began making all sorts of mean comments about him 
They were calling him a freak amongst other unflattering names. I told my friends to stop it. He was just a guy going for a walk through the neighborhood. I told them to stop spreading such harsh lies about him. Of course, my friends took offense to this. You know how kids are, when you challenge their misinformation, they'll try fiercely to defend it. Basically, one of my friends said this to me. Well, if you don't believe that guy is a psychopath, why don't you go up and talk to him then? I really didn't want to, but I guess I really didn't have an excuse at this point, so I said I would. As the walker got close to the park, I slowly began to move up to him. Actually, I felt a little bit scared, but I wasn't sure why. I guess it was just apprehension about talking to someone I'd never spoken to before. Anyway, I walked right up to him, gave him a friendly smile, and said, Hey man, how's it going? Quicker than I thought possible, the man suddenly grabbed me by my arm. With his other hand, he pulled something out of his jacket pocket and stabbed me in the arm with it. My friends saw what was happening, and they ran towards the walker, screaming at him. He let go of me and promptly ran off into the distance. A couple of my friends threw rocks after him. When I saw what the man had stuck in my arm, I almost had a heart attack. It was a dirty, filthy syringe, and he had stuck it deep. It scared the crap out of me. I had to have my mom take me to the hospital, and we called the police as well. Apparently, it was a used heroin needle. I was very lucky to not have contracted any sort of disease, although they did find some traces of heroin in my system. The guy was arrested, of course, and we pressed charges very firmly. You know, it's kind of funny. You try to be a good person, and then you realize that those people not being good people were the ones who ended up being right all along. So who really was good in the end? Even though I was really looking forward to college from my freshman year, and I was excited about living in the dorms, the one thing I was not too excited about were the rules my school had regarding freshman housing. All freshmen had to have either a double or a triple room. We had to have a dorm mate, and we were not allowed to pick our dorm mate either. A few of my friends from high school were going to the same school, and I'd really wanted a room with one of them. But no, I was matched up with a guy named Colin. Still though, I tried to remain positive about my experience. I mean, I had been looking forward to going to school for a long time. Meeting Colin though, you know, it really did heighten my disappointment. He was really weird and very dark as well. And I don't mean in like a goth sort of way or something like that. Colin was dark. He was morose. He looked like someone who'd never gone outside before ever. He was extremely pale, uneven facial hair. Even though it was hot as hell outside, he always wore this ratty dark blue hoodie with the hood pulled up all the way over his face. He even slept in it every day. In fact, I don't think I ever saw him take it off once and the times I saw him sleep at all were very few. I mean, I guess he had to have slept sometimes, but it definitely was never when I was trying to sleep. He had a book lamp over his bed and would spend the entire night reading. His eyes were always extremely bloodshot, and I began to wonder if he was on some sort of drugs or something. He really gave me the creeps. The worst thing about Colin, however, was the way he never said much of anything to me at all. He barely acknowledged me. It was like I didn't even exist. When I'd first met him, I got a half nod and a hey when I introduced myself. But even though Colin was weird and standoffish, I tried my best to be just fine with him. He was never mean to me exactly. For the first couple of months of living together, it was never tense either. He just did his own thing and I did mine. It began to get extremely weird though. One night when I was sleeping, I was suddenly woke up by Colin screaming at someone. Then I heard the unmistakable sounds of someone being beat over and over again. I opened my eyes but didn't get up yet. I was surprised at first that Colin seemed to have brought someone into the room while I was sleeping, but it turned out he actually hadn't. Colin was standing in the center of the room, punching himself in the face over and over again. I was actually a little bit scared, so I pretended to be asleep. He didn't carry on beating himself for very long and soon the room was quiet. He continued to stand there at the center though, 
not moving. After a very long time, I finally fell back asleep. At first, I was definitely frightened. I even considered going to the housing department and letting them know what happened, demanding I be transferred to a different room. It was actually one of my buddies that convinced me not to, though. He told me he'd personally had moments of frustration with his own life in the world, and he'd punched himself before, too. Didn't do it regularly or anything, but it was definitely a thing other people did sometimes. What convinced me to overlook it, though, was when he said at least he was taking out his frustrations on himself and not someone else. At the time, my friend's words made sense to me, but looking back, they really shouldn't have. Afterwards, Colin didn't end up beating himself again or anything like that. He went back to being his weird, solemn self. About a week before Thanksgiving break was coming up, though, I was woken up again by a loud noise coming from Colin's bed. This time, it was not a yell or a punching sound. It was like a suppressed exclamation of pain. Although I'd woken up, my head was still under the blanket, so I couldn't see what he was doing. I opened my eyes and peered out from a corner of the blanket, only to see the most terrifying sight I had ever seen in my life. Colin was standing on his bed, completely naked, coated in blood, and slicing himself open with what looked like a serrated knife. The shock caused me to jump out of bed and ask him what the hell he was doing. Colin stared at me, his eyes bulging wide. He dropped the knife on the blood-stained bed sheets. He held out his hands and extended his fingers like he was trying to grab something out of the air over and over. I had never been so scared in my life. I immediately ran down the hall to the RA's room and started pounding on her door. She got up and I explained what was wrong. She called campus security and an ambulance. She then told me to show her to my room. When we got back, Colin was on the bed, covered in blood and wounds. It was such a sickly sight I can barely even begin to describe it. The campus police got there quickly and tried to tend to Colin while keeping the RA and I in the hall asking us questions. Colin was taken to the hospital. I never saw him again. Of course, I don't know what was wrong with him either. Looking back, it seems he may have had some sort of borderline personality disorder. Housing let me take my things out of my room the following day, and they upgraded me to a single room due to my experience. Colin didn't appear to school again. I know that because the RA had us all sign him a card. I hope he's okay. I hope Colin was able to take care of the problems he had and go back to school somewhere. I feel bad about the experience. Maybe if I'd told the RA about Colin punching himself, they would have known something was wrong sooner and tried to get him some kind of help. I don't know. When I was 17, I babysat for a house right on the outside of town. It wasn't a rural setting, one of those homes that's not on a block in a neighborhood though. It was set just off a local highway and was at the end of a good 50 yards or so driveway. The father of the family worked in pharmaceuticals and was really well off. We used to always joke he was only able to buy the house because he made so much drug money. Three years earlier, my parents drove me over until I was 16. At that point, I got a car. Fortunately, I had a lot of babysitting money from that job I had been saving up, specifically to grab one. I really enjoyed this job, which I guess is quite obvious, since I'd been with them for many years. I'd never run into any serious problems there. At worst, the kids would pick a few little fights with each other or things like that. During a Saturday night in the spring when I was 17, though, something very odd happened. It was raining and storming pretty hard, and I had put the youngest kids to bed already. The oldest boy, Bobby, was 13, and he was allowed to remain up a bit later. I had been watching television while Bobby was in the other room playing video games. I was startled when I suddenly heard a knock at the door. I got up, wondering who in the world would be there this late at night during a heavy storm. I went over to the door and peeked through the glass window on it. I saw a random man standing there. A car running with its lights on was right behind him. The man was dressed in all black and a heavy trench coat. With the lights of his car shining behind him, I could barely see any of his features. I asked the man if I could help him through the door. I clearly had no desire to open it up. 
He simply asked me if someone named Charlotte was there. Well, no one named Charlotte lived in this house, so I told him the truth. Oh, sorry, wrong house. He walked over to his car, hopped in, and drove slowly away. It was weird, but I didn't really think that much about it. I went back and started watching TV again. Nearly 45 minutes later, though, Bobby was looking out the front window when he noticed there was a car pulling into the driveway. I got up and went to take a peek. It parked with the lights shining up at the house, and a man in a black trench coat rocked right up to the door and knocked on it. When I asked who it was, the exact same exchange happened as before. The man asked me if a Charlotte was home. I told him he'd already been here and asked me that question before. I told him no one named that lived here. Sorry, wrong house again. Look, can you help me out here and uh, help me figure out these directions? I seem to be very lost. I declined, telling him no offense, but I didn't want to open the door for a strange man. He asked again and tried being persistent for a little while, but eventually got the picture I was not going to open the door. He hopped into his car and slowly drove away again. I looked over at Bobby and commented about how weird it was. He looked absolutely terrified though. I asked him what was wrong. He just told me not to answer the door if the guy came back and to call the police right away. The guy didn't come back. When Bobby's parents got home, I told them about what had happened and I asked why Bobby had been so scared. They told me that before they met me, they had a babysitter named Blair who used to work for them. Blair had disappeared one night while she was babysitting the kids. Apparently, someone had pulled into the driveway. They had security cameras set up outside. Not surprising, as I mentioned these people have a lot of money. A man, seen wearing a trench coat, walked out and asked if Charlotte was there. Apparently, he had asked Blair to come out and help him with directions because he said he was lost. Blair did this and the two of them walked out of view of the camera. And that was the last time anyone ever saw her. I don't know why a person who abducted a teenage girl would ever come back to the same house. That seems incredibly stupid to me. Bobby's father figured it must have been vanity or something. He was successful once in a rich person's house and wanted to try once again. I really have no idea though. All I can tell you is I'm very thankful I did not decide to open that door. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now guys, so thank you so much for watching and I hope you guys have a great day.